spend about a half an hour uh, talking uh, about gene therapy and have some time uh, afterwards for uh, questions. I'm going to cover several different topics uh, on this area, including just giving you kind of a, an update on the current state of cell and gene therapy, um, uh, talking a little bit about overcoming barriers in development, um, uh, talk about why uh, we need to be thinking about global regulatory convergence in this area, uh, and talk a little bit about what FDA is trying to do as well. So let's just start on our current state of gene therapy. Uh, right now in the United States, we now have 10 approved gene therapies. Six of these are chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapies, um, primarily for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and multiple myeloma. Uh, also, they cover uh, acute lymphoid leukemia, uh, at least two of them. Uh, these, uh, the hematologic malignancies have proven a, a good uh, place for these therapies, and these are uh, poised to expand uh, further into uh, solid tumors now that we're starting to see uh, second and third generation chimeric antigen receptor T cells. We have uh, two more recent approvals, uh, uh, Zinteglo and uh, Skyzona, which are uh, modified uh, stem cells. Um, those are genetically modified stem cell therapies for uh, uh, beta thalassemia uh, and uh, a, a relatively rare disorder, um, uh, uh, adrenal leukodystrophy, uh, but uh, again, making uh, a big differences uh, in those diseases. And then we have two directly administered gene therapies. Those are essentially vectors that are administered either locally, um, uh, which is what Luxterna is uh, for a type of hereditary uh, blindness to treat that. Uh, and uh, Zolgensma, which is a systemically administered gene therapy, which is the paradigm that I'll talk about, um, about how we hope to see uh, gene therapy uh, bringing promise for a variety of rare diseases. There is a very robust global pipeline uh, in terms of the genetically modified T cells, as I've already noted. Um, I, I suspect that as we see the allogeneic uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, that is, uh, these are uh, genetically modified T cells where the starting material are cells uh, from normal donors, so they're not previously treated, and you can uh, therefore make uh, batches that can be uh, uh, that can treat fifty to one hundred uh, individuals at a time, uh, and uh, make them uh, so that they're off-the-shelf therapies. This may be a, a game changer. Um, in terms of making these uh, more affordable, but also in helping them to move into the treatment of, uh, of solid tumors. Because when you're using these uh, in, in that type of a setting, one can make multiple genetic modifications, uh, which may make uh, a big difference. Um, uh, we also see the therapies for hemoglobinopathies. There are multiple uh, therapies, uh, uh, gene, genome editing and other therapies in uh, process for sickle cell disease, uh, which is the uh, hemoglobinopathy uh, that is most common in the United States that would be addressable. Uh, for hemophilia A and B, uh, I would expect that in the next year or so, we will see uh, gene therapies addressing those. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's public that certain, uh, uh, certain uh, companies have already filed uh, with FDA. Uh, and then there are a variety of other rarer disorders um, that are uh, in the pipeline um, uh, uh, coming forward, uh, not to mention uh, uh, gene therapies addressing more common diseases uh, that are in development. So I just wanted to use uh, this uh, product, Zolgensma or Anasemna gene as its, uh, its uh, generic name um, uh, for uh, an example here of, of what can happen when things really go right with gene therapy. So spinal muscular atrophy is quite a terrible uh, disease. It's one of the more common rare diseases um, uh, that we see. Spinal muscular atrophy type one um, is a, a, a disease that affects motor neurons uh, and children are born, they look normal at birth um, uh, and uh, they react normally at birth. But by the time they're a few months old, uh, they uh, are unable to meet the normal developmental milestones, such as lifting the head, uh, and they can't sit, and they don't walk, uh, and eventually they lose enough motor function 
uh, that they can't breathe on their own. And they usually succumb to this uh, disease uh, by the time they're two or three years old. So uh, because of the very clear natural history, um, uh, there were uh, treatments developed for this. The first was essentially um, an antisense treatment, but then uh, subsequently um, uh, a gene therapy uh, was studied uh, and uh, submitted to FDA. Uh, the graphic on the left just shows you um, there are 15 uh, children who were treated early on in life before uh, six months of age, uh, and 14 out of the 15 develop normally. That, uh, that dotted line uh, on the horizontal there, if you're above it, you're normal. If you're below it, you're abnormal. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you, one could look out at, at, at children who were four or five years old uh, and see kids like the one on the right who were running around. Now to see that that child was three at the time, she's older now, um, to see children developing completely normally at that age uh, is you don't need to be a statistician. You don't need fine measuring devices, uh, you know, to uh, find differences uh, in scores on, uh, on neuromuscular tests. You basically can use your eyes and see that this is different than the natural history. So this is gene therapy when it really works. It doesn't always work this well, but this is what uh, we aim for. And um, some of this probably has to do with these children were treated very early in life, um, and that made a difference. Uh, uh, but um, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable when it works. The fact is, though, that there are hundreds of rare genetic diseases that could be addressed by gene therapy right now if we could develop the framework to help move these, uh, these therapies along <coughs> in a in, in a manner uh, that was uh, essentially um, uh, commercially viable. And that's a little bit of the theme here that I'll talk to you about is how do we get to commercial viability uh, for rare disease gene therapy? Because if we could, uh, there are any number of these gene therapies that we could see coming through the development uh, pathway uh, that could address a lot of serious illnesses. Additionally, if we can get gene therapy to work for rare disorders, we will learn a lot about this. We'll learn a lot about the clinical course of people treated with gene therapy, as well as a bit about how to really scale up the manufacturing, maybe a lot about scaling up the manufacturing, such that we may be able someday to address more common uh, issues uh, such as heart disease uh, with gene therapies. Um, uh, that could be a real game changer because there are at least theoretically uh, gene therapies that could be developed that could address, for instance, high cholesterol, <coughs> excuse me, high cholesterol that could be one once and done gene therapies uh, and uh, could reduce cholesterol by half. But um, one needs to be able to make them at scale and make sure that they're really safe. Um, uh, so just moving along here, one of the issues that we've come to realize is that although we often talked about personalized medicine previously, we're now in this era of individualized medicine where we have customized products such as the chimeric antigen receptor, T cells, cancer vaccines, where these are products where, although the indication for use of the product is the same uh, uh, and they have the same mode of action, each of them has a certain personalization to it. Either it's made with somebody's own cells or the the, the product is treated with something from the patient to make it unique for that patient. And then we have created products where somebody has a gene defect and we go and make a, a product to address that uh, particular genetic defect. Now, you might say, well, what's this customized product stuff and, and, and how far does that go? Well, it turns out that because some of what we've learned uh, is that you can potentially address uh, genetic defects at the gene level with genome editing. That's this CRISPR-Cas9 that Jennifer Doudna uh, won the Nobel Prize for 
a uh, year ago, um, that genome editing acts on a single base pair, which means now you're really talking about creating potentially unique products. And so getting this paradigm right is important. So how do we overcome barriers uh, in the development of these therapies? And I could, we could go on about all kinds of different uh, barriers that we need to try to overcome, but I'm gonna to try to pick the ones that are most important for us to talk about. And uh, those two are manufacturing and product access. Just so you know that I'm not, just, I'm, I'm not uh, in uh, uh, an ivory tower and not thinking about them. Um, Non-clinical development, that is how we model these um, rare diseases is important uh, and how we generate uh, models of disease, either using cells and organoids or using uh, small animal models. Those are very important, um, uh, but we're actually getting better at that. Uh, and then how we deal with clinical development is also very important because in some cases you only have 10, 20 people to study or even less. And how do you decide that something is safe and effective to use? And so we need to be using different types of designs in which we can't do a randomized trial, but instead we use a patient as their own control in terms of some baseline run-in period. And then uh, each patient that goes through treatment with a, uh, a particular gene therapy informs the next person's likelihood of uh, either responding or not responding. And that, what I just defined for you is actually the definition of what a Bayesian clinical trial is, which is, uh, although it sounds fancy, all it, all it says is that um, uh, prior performance helps predict future performance. <laughs> Um, uh, it's something that uh, many in the business world already know. Um, uh, and so uh, that's uh, uh, the way we're thinking about that. But let's, let's focus on manufacturing now and product access. So right now in the United States, commercial viability for gene therapy is really quite interesting. Because one has to sink a lot of money into a facility, excuse me for one sec, <coughs> Sorry, just a little bit of a dry throat. Uh, um, because one has to sink a bunch of money into a facility for manufacturing, into the costs of equipment, one has to figure out a way to recoup your cost if you're going to actually be able to come with a net present value that is uh, reasonable for your asset over time. And where that sits right now is in gene therapies where one can sell 100 or maybe 200 doses a year. That brings in enough revenue over the course of time to balance things out. Um, and I'm not an MBA, but I'm, I've been around enough of them over the course of the years to, uh, to know that, uh, th that this becomes an important uh, calculation. Now, very large uh, numbers of treatments for gene therapy are still beyond our technologic capacity because we just don't have the manufacturing capacity yet. We will someday. The problem is in making these very small runs of gene therapies where the setup cost is such that it's hard to recoup the, uh, the, the costs of setting up making the gene therapy. And, and so the cost of making a run of 20 or 40 doses of gene therapy ends up being very close to the costs of making 100 or 200 doses. Now, there are contract manufacturers increasingly that are doing that, which is an important uh, way that this is happening, but it's been a challenge and the cost there uh, has been a real challenge. Think of this a little bit like, uh, like wedding invitations. If you print a thousand wedding invitations or 50 wedding invitations that are ha hand, you know, at, a, at an expensive printer, the difference in your, the, the, the cost, the setup cost is the same. And so that's what you're really paying for here. Okay, so one of the ways that this is, this is, I, I know this is, this is probably scary to show to someone, but this is actually one of the ways to deal with this. This, this schematic is not meant for me to spend the next half hour taking you through the various steps in adeno-associated viral vector purification. 
but it's just to show you that we can actually make, <clears throat> sorry, that we can actually make, excuse me, <clears throat> okay, I apologize for that. That'll teach me for having a cup of coffee right and chugging it down just before I, uh, I give a talk. Um, the, um, the idea here is that a lot of the steps that go into making gene therapies can be automated. And that could ultimately lead to a machine, a device that actually can make these. That is the ultimate way of making things less expensive. Why? Because instead of having to have all of the hand setup costs, you have the device that then can be essentially repurposed from one vector production to another. And gene therapies actually are very amenable to that. Why? Because unlike uh, small molecule drugs, which each one, although yeah, they may have uh, some things in common, each one is pretty unique. But gene therapies, because they share a backbone, which is essentially the guts that carries uh, the gene of interest into the cell, that, that razor handle uh, can be uh, used with a lot of different razor blades. And so a machine can potentially, a device could potentially help in this production. And you can imagine much like this, again, just this is a, a placeholder, uh, one of those uh, soda dispensers that can give you uh, several hundred different combinations of sodas. But you can imagine that you could have a device that could be used to make a variety of different gene therapies. And that could uh, help, uh, help really alleviate the problems with setup costs because what you really have then is a device that uses disposables uh, and uh, can, can make different gene therapies on demand. So this would hopefully be one of the things that we'll see in the coming years. Our center is actually funding some research um, trying to get this kind of automated vector production um, miniaturized and to have the right automated controls, which computers can really do a great job on, um, uh, uh, sensing uh, different changes in process and tuning it. Uh, so that ultimately you could have a device that could really help with this. The other things we're trying to do uh, from a regulatory standpoint is make a regulatory framework that really helps people accelerate development. And one of the things is trying to help people use a uniform process for development. One of the problems in this area has been that a lot of the innovation comes out of academic laboratories, really neat concepts. The problem is academics, having been one myself, they tend to do things the way they want to using whatever local uh, protocol they have. The problem is when you're a company and you're looking to license something in, you want something that reproducibly is going to give you technology transfer so that you can make it at scale and study it. Uh, or if you're a contract manufacturer, you need to be able to adapt it to your process quickly and be able to make it. Um, uh, at scale. In either case, it doesn't help if you have to retool everything every time and it's different from every different academic. If we could get people to come onto the same page and, and use the same protocols, that might help a lot. That's what happened in molecular biology early on and it made a big difference. It could help here as well. And then from the regulatory standpoint, and this is more of a nuts and bolts regulatory issue, at FDA, we're looking to see if we could find ways to allow manufacturers to leverage uh, the data in their applications from one product to the next. In other words, somebody submits an application for one gene therapy, they decide they're gonna make another one that uses the same backbone that I was talking about. Rather than submitting all the information on toxicology, manufacturing and controls for that backbone, they just reference it, cross-reference it. And that saves money on toxicology, which costs a lot of money uh, relatively, and uh, the amount of time that gets spent on what probably is not value added work. Um, this is just as an illustration here for you of, of this kind of the nature of gene therapies, which is that really 
The part of the gene therapy that's the business end is the insert that uh, is the protein of interest that you're replacing. The way it gets to where it's going is through a vector uh, that helps produce the, uh, the virus uh, that brings it into the cell. In some cases, even, you don't need, even though you don't have a virus, you have uh, at least other pieces of uh, genetic material there that help uh, get the thing into the cell and get it expressed. So either way, you have this backbone that's the same over and over again. And the idea here that we're thinking about is, well, you don't, you, you don't have to characterize this every time. You just have to know about this uh, insert. So I, I want to move on to talking about how people can get access to cell and gene therapies. Traditionally, um, these products are, uh, are investigated with investigational new drug applications, usually through research um, uh, uh, INDs. Um, there are expanded access programs, and we suspect that in this area, um, as we see more products investigated, we'll see more expanded access programs. Um, there is a type of expanded access that even allows recouping the cost of production uh, of uh, a gene therapy, and that may help facilitate this in some cases. It turns out that in some cases, gene therapies are developed, for instance, for treatment of the youngest individuals because they may have the greatest chance of benefiting them. But uh, there is a desire to potentially treat older individuals who have less chance of benefiting those may not; those individuals may not be uh, enrolled into clinical studies, but giving them uh, the ability to have expanded access may be helpful. So uh, that that's uh, how that gets used. And then our other pathways is ultimately an investigation of drug application. Hopefully, leads to the submission of a biologics license application, uh, which is how we um, authorize the marketing of uh, products in the United States, either through a full approval, which is the traditional approval pathway, or through accelerated approval. And I wanna say a few more words about accelerated approval because this is an area where we're looking to really lean into um, in gene therapy because it turns out that for some of these rare genetic diseases, trying to get to a traditional approval may be too much of a challenge when you only have 10 or 20 patients, at least on the first go round, and you may need more time. So talked about expanded access, so I'm gonna skip over this slide. I talked a little bit about individual patient access, which is another way um, that individuals can get, a um, uh, single individual can get access to a gene therapy. Um, we generally have to see that in, in this case that there's likely to be some benefit um, and I talked about accelerated approval. Now, this concept of accelerated approval based on a surrogate endpoint or intermediate clinical endpoint that's reasonably likely to predict a, a clinical benefit of a drug, it turns out that, yes, for some of these rare genetic diseases, we're lucky enough that there's an enzyme missing or protein missing. And so there is a surrogate that we can look at that of something that might bring clinical benefit, which is that if somebody doesn't have a protein, and we know that that protein is what, the lack of that protein is what causes the disease, showing that that protein is produced by the gene therapy um, is probably a good surrogate um, uh, in, in, in many cases that the product may work. Now, in some cases that might not be shown ultimately because maybe you're producing the protein too late in the process, but this is a way at least of trying to move things ahead um, in a faster way than waiting for clinical endpoints always where um, that could take years and could unfortunately lead to people not getting the benefit of gene therapy, which in certain diseases, for instance, like it would in that spinal muscular atrophy case would lead to people's demise. So this is a reason for trying to accelerate uh, this process. Now, you might say, why do I care about global regulatory convergence at FDA? And the reason why I care about that um, is because we have this issue that we know that robust commercial viability is 100 to 200 gene therapy treatments per year. We also know that 
there are a lot of diseases where we might only have 20 to 50 individuals in the US with these uh, diseases, which means that probably there are 40 to 60 or 70 in Europe, and there might be you know, uh, as many as those combined in Asia. Now that's uh, obviously assuming a, an even distribution among uh, populations like there is in, in hemophilia. Um, but the whole point here is that even though any one country may not have enough patients to have commercial viability, in aggregate, there may be commercial viability. And we could go, you know, speak from now until the end of the day about issues with reimbursement, et cetera. But uh, even if you assume that there'll be some differences in, in reimbursement, if you could have in aggregate these larger populations easily and have companies actually have to submit one application and meet one set of standards, you might be able to make more things commercially viable. Um, and uh, ultimately, if you could make things available in high income countries that way, you might be able to have populations in low and middle income countries benefit because either through philanthropy uh, or through other programs, and that might be really important. Why? Because uh, for the good of the order, um, you know, populations in low and middle income countries may stand to benefit the most from gene therapies because they don't have access to the supportive care that high income countries have. So for instance, um, in, uh, in, in the blood disorder, uh, beta thalassemia, where the treatment is blood transfusion and uh, removal of excess iron that comes with blood transfusion, um, uh, they just don't have access to that. And that means that those people die. On the other hand, a gene therapy, uh, even though that we're not gonna be able to get that kind of supportive care into those countries, on the other hand, a one-time gene therapy that fixes things, you could potentially see um, access to. So um, that is a, uh, a, a point here that uh, may make a difference. Um, now, obviously, you know, lower income countries don't have experience with gene therapies so that if they could leverage uh, what we're doing in higher income countries, that could make a difference. But ultimately, if our, um, if our global collaboration uh, were more robust, um, you could imagine that we could see better uh, improvement of technologies um, uh, and more focus on value added. I think what's come to me from my other hat as somebody who was initially quite involved in uh, Operation Warp Speed, um, uh, uh, that really um, this, this ability uh, to uh, leverage um, uh, collaborative technology um, is potentially uh, tremendously beneficial. Um, we could we could see a real uh, a real advance in in our ability to uh, get these gene therapies to uh, benefit people. Um, the other reason why I think we need global collaboration here is because, um, and this this goes not just to gene therapies. I haven't said a ton about cell therapies. I mentioned them in terms of genetically modified cell therapies, but let me just say to you that the problem um, with quacky therapies in this area is that all it takes is one really bad disaster in cell or gene therapy and the whole field could be set back. So the idea that we have better global collaboration is really important because uh, if something bad happens here, it will affect our European colleagues. If something bad happens in Europe, it will affect us here. And there are some real areas where we can have convergence. Uh, in terms of preclinical study requirements. Um, there is something called environmental assessments. Basically, when you give a gene therapy, you're giving something that potentially could be shed out into the environment as an organism in some cases. And so those things are different from location to location. Um, manufacturing information and manufacturing requirements are different from country to country. Um, and sometimes the clinical requirements are. And when you think about it, for these really small populations of a couple hundred people, what's actually happening is barriers to access and barriers to entry that were put in place to prevent countries' own larger pharmaceutical industries are actually impairing the ability to treat P. 
people with rare diseases. So I think we have to try to overcome those. It would benefit us, um, uh, at particularly um, our people, people in our country would have access to more gene therapies um, and actually our sponsors um, would have access to um, more opportunities to uh, have their products used. So we're really working right now um, towards convergence. In fact, uh, there is a very active uh, engagement with meetings actually this week, right now as we speak um, at, uh, at the WHO uh, towards trying to come to some regulatory convergence in this area. Um, and we're really trying to work with sponsors um, to start to harmonize our, our global uh, development programs. Um, so hopefully some of uh, the learning we've had over the past years from COVID-19 will also be able to be um, uh, uh, made use of here. And there's a white paper uh, that's been produced um, and um, I think hopefully some public-private partnerships will also help us in this area. So just to finish up, um, we at the Center for Biologics are really trying to uh, improve uh, the gene therapy environment here, uh, most of all in the United States. Uh, one of the issues that we've had with our original Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies, which is the office at, our, at FDA that uh, handles gene therapies, is that the field has grown so rapidly um, that we have not been able to keep up. We were very lucky that industry essentially understood that and incredibly grateful for uh, the efforts of some of the uh, industry trade groups who helped get us another 125 or so staff to uh, hire uh, or positions that we can hire into in the coming year or two uh, to help get rid of this backlog and, and to try to address moving these therapies forward. So um, we're reorganizing that office into an office into a larger office of uh, therapeutic products, um, which will allow us hopefully to have increased interactions with stakeholders to help our timeliness of response because that has been a bear uh, and it's, it's, it's not been anything like I'd like to see and also to help us provide consistent responses. Again, from intimate understanding of Operation Warp Speed, it may not sound like it, but one of the most important things for sponsors is getting rapid responses to questions about their development programs. Now, we have a system in place of type ABCD meetings, which means normally it takes, even in the fastest of these, it's usually at, at, at best a 30-day turnaround time if you are on the clock. On the other hand, if one can do that much faster, like maybe like send an email in the morning, get on the phone by, by late morning and get an answer by the afternoon or at worst the next morning, you can imagine that could really be a game changer. And that's kind of where we'd like to head. So uh, we uh, uh, really want to work to more clearly define uh, also the accelerated approval pathways for gene therapy. Um, Clearly, the cellular therapy development pathways need some better definition uh, in terms of what our requirements are for manufacturing and controls, and that's, we're working to do that. Um, and the manufacturing technologies we'll continue to work on as well. Ultimately, we're very committed to advancing uh, the development of cell and gene therapies because we do see this as kind of the next wave in therapies. Um, uh, and we are very lucky in the United States to be global leaders uh, in this area. Um, and we've managed to keep that edge um, uh, through, I think, a tremendous amount of work that comes out of our academic laboratories. And also, I think, through um, uh, a lot of the innovative approaches um, that uh, various companies have taken. So uh, our goal is to help I continue and to remain a world leader in this area, um, not just in the production of these, but also in our regulatory uh, uh, ways of doing this. And I think our colleagues in the uh, reimbursement field are trying to also figure out ways to uh, best think about models for paying for these. So with that, um, I will uh, stop. I went on a little bit longer than I thought I would. I apologize for a little bit of that dry throat in the middle. Um, but I think we have a minute or two or three for questions, and it looks 
I, I will turn it back over to uh, Peter. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, Peter, you can see them. Uh, yeah, I, I can see. Do you want me to take the questions that are in the uh, chat here? Yeah, you can take whichever ones or any or all that you want. And uh, I'll leave it up to you, but there are at least three that are in the chat box. And Great, I see them right now. Great, sorry, I was just having a little trouble hearing you. So let me, um, uh, you know, so let me just go over this. These are all great questions. Um, uh, so what's the stance of SIVA regarding substituting IND enabling animal testing with bench testing? And there are, are there any uh, current new guidelines regarding that? I, that's a great question. The idea here is, are there ways that instead of going through development of an animal model that perhaps you might be able to use, I think this question was probably referring to cell lines or other models uh, or even in silico um, uh, 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 testing. And we don't have guidance out yet, but we're clearly thinking about this. And I suspect that in the coming few years, we, you may hear more about this from us. Um, uh, and there is this question about, do we discriminate against using imaging as surrogate endpoints? No, I think imaging is a perfectly reasonable surrogate endpoint, as long as we can feel confident that what we're looking at um, are really true changes. Um, and that means that we usually when we, when we use imaging, um, for uh, looking at changes. For instance, if it was in an individual over time, we'd wanna make sure that uh, the, for instance, that the reads of those images were blinded um, by perhaps a panel of different radiologists to make sure that what we're getting is um, not biased um, because that is the problem with radiology. Um, with all due respect to uh, uh, radiologist as an internist, I can tell you that um, I, one too many times I would go to a radiologist and the radiologist would say, would, wouldn't see anything. And they said, oh, but what you're looking, what are you looking for? And you tell them what they were looking for and suddenly they'd find something. So we just have to make sure we have the, <laughs> we have the right, uh, the right controls in place. And then th this other question is a really good one too. How can the FDA selectively promote curative therapy? versus mere medical treatments that concentrate on the symptoms and not the underlying disease? That is a, a, another, another really great question. And I think that goes to what we are doing with gene therapy, which is that in our benefit risk calculus, those that are really trying to get at the underlying disease and, uh, and have a curative therapy will have a much easier time dealing with toxicities. In other words, we will accept a certain amount of toxicity and that amount of toxicity will be greater for a potentially curative therapy than it will be for something that's just um, a palliative or a, a symptomatic treatment for some uh, disease. Because again, if, you're, if, if somebody says that there's you know, a very good chance they're going to cure you, if there's a small chance of some adverse effect, that is more that that is a better risk benefit calculus than um, if somebody uh, comes along and says, "Well, I'm just going to make you feel a little bit better," but there's also this same risk. The benefit risk is not the same. Um, uh, I, you know, and 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 somebody here's a great question: Are organoid models making mouse models obsolete in drug discovery? I hate to say it, I'm not, I'm, I'm the institutional official for our animal facility. I'm not going to hang up our animal facility just yet because I think there are some things that mouse models are still very helpful for. And the reason why is organoids, you know, if you have something that just affects one organ system, like the liver or the brain, you, or these models are very good. But when we have things that are affect multiple organ systems, mouse models are still very helpful. Um, they're also very helpful because. Um, mice, it turns out mice are very, they're very close to us in terms of, of the, their, their genetic identity. Um, uh, and uh, they, they do help us understand sometimes uh, even the, the, the scope of what a gene therapy's off targets 
uh, 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 potential may be. So I, I think probably organoids are a great complement to mouse models, but I, I don't think they're going to replace them just yet. And I think I got to the questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Peter. That's been wonderful and some great questions.